Hello and welcome. Today we are in the new tier 8 US heavy cruiser, the Anchorage. She was given to me by Wargaming for review purposes. So what do I think of her? Well, she clearly must be overpowered. You see, Anchorage was named after a city in Alaska and Alaska used to be Russian territory. Combine this with some Bush and Reyes and clearly the Anchorage must be overpowered. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I would like to thank the patrons and pay. Okay, I'm just kidding. So the Anchorage is a buffalo at tier 8, but she gets New Orleans AP and a longer reload. Her party piece is the smokescreen that she gets instead of the radar that the buffalo has. And she obviously does not get a heal or the tier 9 upgrade. And that's essentially it. Oh, and she also gets Fletcher torpedoes. One set of four torpedoes per side. They're pretty amazing, I'll be honest. And people really don't seem to expect them. So what is my actual opinion of her? Well, I think she is... She does definitely feel powerful. Some of it might be because the ship is unknown and people simply don't know how to play against her or they don't know what the ship can offer. But some of it definitely, I think feels better than actually playing the buffalo. In fact, in a tier 9 battle I would rather be in an anchorage exactly as she is than a buffalo. But I think that comes more down to, well, the buffalo just doesn't feel great for tier 9. And the smokescreen is one of those kind of universal tools that make you able to match up against higher tier ships better. Because, as you can tell, you know, this is a tier 10 battle right now. You can see a Grossakov us there, a Kremlin just passed us. In a match like this, in a Buffalo, I would have to find an island and try to sit behind said island to try to, you know, shoot at the red ships. But in this match, I can utilize a smokescreen combined with the Hydro. Now, I do need to keep in mind that there are quite a few downsides. This ship isn't quite a Mikhail Kutuzov at tier 8. You see, a Kutuzov has 19.1 km range base. The Anchorage has 15.6 and you can't really extend it because these are 100 or 203 mm guns. And uh, you also have to keep in mind that the Anchorage has a smoke firing penalty of 8 km. So if a ship enters within 8 km, as she fires her guns in a smokescreen, she gets spotted. And I think this kind of uh, smoke firing penalty is actually quite a nice balancing factor. Because a destroyer can sail up to an anchorage, and when the anchorage fires her guns, the anchorage gets spotted. And uh, even if the anchorage then leaves the smokescreen, the destroyer won't be spotted herself. So, you know, a destroyer can do that. And because the Anchorage obviously doesn't have a radar or something along those lines, you know, like a Belfast does, well, the destroyer will be rather safe. But I think the greatest thing the Anchorage does offer, though, is that I don't think we've had before a smoke ship with powerful AP. Now, I get it, uh, the Anchorage does have New Orleans AP, the tier 6 or 7 US heavy cruiser, but that's... That only really matters for the 400 damage. It's 4600 versus the 5000 of the Baltimore. Buffalo has the same AP. But that doesn't really matter against most targets. You see, it only really matters against cruisers, you know, in regards to penetration. When you're firing at battleships and the broadsides of battleships, it's kind of irrelevant. But what does matter is that Quite often, you see when you when you fire at the uh, decks of uh, tier 8 battleships or even higher tier battleships, you'll find that you shatter quite many of your HE shells. You know, you'll deal like 2,000 damage, 3,000 damage, 4,000 damage, sometimes even 5,000 damage. But that does but that's nothing compared to what happens when you fire AP. You can sometimes get 7k salvos, 8k salvos. And at that point, uh, even the alpha damage just matters. But you do have to keep in mind that she has a 15.5 second reload. She is definitely not winning any DPM competitions. But, you know, 
that's kind of the price you pay for the torpedoes and the smokescreen at the same time. And I also have to say that just the torpedoes alone probably make her, in my opinion, better to use than, well, a buffalo. Because a battleship is not going to push into you. Well, I mean, during the testing phases and, you know, at the start when she is released, battleships are obviously going to do that because they don't know that the Anchorage has torpedoes. But eventually people are going to learn. And this means that battleships aren't going to push close range into you. You see, if, if you're in, a, say, I don't know, Massachusetts, and you see an Anchorage, a buffalo, you have no problem going close range. If you see an Anchorage, you probably might think twice, because there's a good chance you're going to eat a few torpedoes in return. And, you know, that ends up taking you out very quickly. However, in a tier 10 battle, you still have to play somewhat defensively. You might notice that there's no CV in this game. If there was a CV, I would have to be in those one of those squares with my teammates. Because one of the downsides of the Anchorage is that she doesn't have any mid-range anti-air. Which means that the Anchorage has effectively very little anti-air. Aveza, that is a tier 6 German crew or carrier, can drop at least twice on you. And that's with your anti-air being all intact. Once it takes some damage, you know, you can basically forget about uh, doing any realistic anti-air damage. Anyway, I am spotted by the destroyer that was in the middle, the daring most likely. So I'll, I'll have to smoke up here again and just keep shelling and hoping for the best. So the reason I complimented the Klebea earlier there though is because, well, the Klebea went into the sea cap, which is kind of unusual for a destroyer of that type. So there are torpedoes coming, but these are easy to dodge because I use the same upgrades and I suppose the captain skills as I do on the buffalo. Which means that I have the propulsion mod. This makes me accelerate very quickly. It's I take them precisely for situations like this with my smoke screen. And I also have the uh, sixth or fifth slot rudder shift upgrade instead of the concealment upgrade. Because this allows me to actually turn. You know, when I say that the ship is a buffalo, it is as sluggish as a buffalo. It does have the 11.2 second rudder shift. You kind of need the uh, special rudder shift or the second rudder shift upgrade to actually get it to a reasonable level so that you don't eat all of those torpedoes. If I didn't have both of those upgrades, I'm pretty sure I would have taken at least one of those torps there. Maybe even two, and two would have actually been enough to just sink me right there. This does, however, mean that I have 11.9 km concealment because I don't have the concealment upgrade. However, it doesn't matter for the smoke screen because your smoke firing penalty is unaffected by concealment upgrade and the concealment uh, expert. Which means that, I, I thought at least, it makes a very good combination as you're going to be spending a lot of your time in the smoke screen. This isn't quite a full US smoke screen. It was nerfed from the earlier testing from 120 seconds to 100 seconds, but it's good enough to be honest. I think the main thing that I really like about the smokescreen is the fact that you can lay down the smokescreen for 30 seconds in a row. Also, I can't believe somebody randomly just followed me as I was playing this match. You know, I wasn't streaming or anything at the time. You see, when you have a 30 second uh, smoke screen that you can lay down in a row and then you can boost it with various things such as the uh, upgrade that makes it longer, although I don't recommend that one. Uh, and there's also the flag now. What makes it very nice is that your smoke screen ends up really long and ships that launch torpedoes at the smoke screen find it difficult to cover everything. You know, they might not actually be able to set this or launch the torpedoes in the areas that you are at. Also, I think that uh, North Carolina is in for a surprise in a bit. Those torpedoes look very much on point. I hope they have enough range though. My smoke screen's up in four, four seconds. <laughs> Sorry about that one, North Carolina, but you were just too juicy of a target to ignore like that. Anyway, smoke screen's up again, so we get to fire further at the uh, Red ships, especially that Yamato. I do like using HE here, mostly because she isn't on fire, and if I get a fire, that adds a whole bunch more damage. 
but I'm going to continue setting in my, in my smoke over here. I mean, I'm in a perfect position this game, to be honest, right? Because nobody really has a reason to sail in my direction, exactly. They want to go over to the cap zone, which means that they're going to pass, you know, through the area where I have set myself up. And I think this is one of those things where ships with a smokescreen are perfect at. Especially, you know, cruiser types that can actually deal a lot of damage. Now, if this were a tier 8 game, we would probably see a lot more uh, battleships with 380mm guns. And in those situations, um, you know, you still are a buffalo, so you do have 27mm bow stern, side armor, and the deck armor. That means that the 380 guns will simply bounce off of you, just like they do on the buffalo. You might have seen that in my buffalo video. So, for those who don't know, essentially this is how it works. When you fire AP at the target, and the target, and let's say it's normal AP, and the target, and the armor plate that is, is between 0 degrees and 45 degrees, then you do your AP penetration calculations as normal. You know, you calculate whether your AP can penetrate that thickness of armor. However, if that armor plate is between 45 and 60 degrees, then you have a linearly increasing chance that the AP shells will simply ricochet, that they don't do any kind of AP penetration calculations, and it simply just bounces off of the armor plate. However, if your uh, armor plate is angled more than 60 degrees, then there's a 100% chance that the AP shells will simply ricochet off of the target. There's one exception there, and that is uh, overmatch. If your AP shells are large enough, then they will simply ignore uh, very thin armor plates. You know, it's regardless how they're angled, and they will simply go through it. And the calculation is, is you take the caliber of the shell and divide it by 14.3. This means that 380mm uh, shells can overmatch 25 millimeters of armor, but they cannot overmatch 37 or 27 millimeters of armor. This ship has 27 millimeters of armor pretty much everywhere, which means that if you point your nose at, say, a Bismarck or a Warspite or, I don't know, a Paman or something like that, then they will simply uh, bounce, or almost all of the shells will simply bounce off of your bow and your side and your deck armor. However, if the ship had 25 millimeter armor plates everywhere, then you would take a million billion trillion damage. Or alternatively, if the enemy ship had higher caliber guns such as 406 millimeter, such as uh, Massachusetts firing on, say, I don't know, a buffalo, uh, then you're probably going to have a very bad time very, very quickly. Or alternatively, a Nagato firing at, uh, say, I don't know, Baltimore, especially at very close range. Now, one of the reasons why the uh, US heavy cruisers are special is because actually their uh, ricochet angles on the AP shells are much better than other ships. Other ships, you know, 0 degrees to 45 degrees is uh, penetration calculations is normal and 45 to 60 is a chance to uh, essentially ricochet off of it. But there's also a chance that they won't ricochet. But on the US heavy cruisers, it's 0 to 60 degrees that you do your AP penetration calculations as normal, and then 60 to 67.5 degrees that there's a chance that they uh, will ricochet off, but also a chance that they won't. And then above 67.5, you know, there's no chance that you will have any kind of uh, penetration calculations. And so US Heavy Cruiser AP, because of that, is quite scary again for many, many, many ships. Now, obvi the obvious example there is the Alaska. That's one of the scariest cruisers to face, in my opinion. But if your cruiser doesn't have, or if your ship doesn't have amazing armor, all of the other US heavy cruisers are somewhat similar. It doesn't matter if it's a New Orleans, an Anchorage, a Baltimore, a Buffalo, a Des Moines, all of them can punish your cruiser quite heavily with their AP. So anyway, there's only an, uh, one Wooster left. I don't actually know if Wooster has that type of AP as well, but I'm pretty sure she's just gonna fire HE here, because I have very little HP at this point. I want to launch my torpedoes, and just hope for the best at this point. 
Then again, you know, it's only one ship, we have five of them, so there's really no chance that they will win. And I've done 140k damage, I think this was quite successful for a tier 10 battle. I don't think I could have done more in, say, well, to be honest, any US heavy cruiser. Maybe a Des Moines, I suppose. But I would have had to play much, much, much more defensively. So, I didn't sink any ships, unfortunately, but I'm happy with 140k in tier 10. And this puts me at squarely number one with 2k base XP. I mean, I mean look at that. Those, those are... There, there's basically... Almost all the ships are tier 10s. There's only two tier 8s. Or, okay, sorry, three tier 8s. And I beat all of them without even sinking anything. So the tarps did 27k. I'm sorry for the on that for that on the North Carolina, but I just had to. She was too juicy of a target. Wow, actually, wow, my Ichi did basically no no damage. I mean, the Ichi did damage, but the fires did nothing. It was the actual floodings that I got lucky on. Oh well, sometimes you know things just work out. So let's take a look at the uh, commander skills and upgrades that I used. So obviously I start out with priority target. I use the same captain as I do on the Baltimore. And then expert marksman, or alternatively adrenaline rush. Uh, then after that superintendent, then I take concealment expert. Then I take the one I didn't before, expert marksman or adrenaline rush. After that, uh, expert loader. Then uh, jack of all trades is also very, very nice to have because it makes your uh, uh, smoke cool down faster. And it's particularly nice to have Expert Marksman and Expert Loader when you have a special US Captain, but it's fine even if you don't. And then you have the last four points, and I don't really know what to go for. I think on this ship in particular, radio location is super useful, because you can tell if a destroyer gets, you know, tries to get within 8 kilometers of you, you know, you get the extra information to keep track of stuff like that. But if you don't like this, I think Demolition Expert plus Preventative Maintenance makes sense. So... Uh, you can see that the the uh, smoke firing penalty is 8 kilometers, right? And as I mentioned, uh, it doesn't matter if uh, you have concealment upgrade or not. So instead I take the uh, steering gears upgrade. This puts us at 6.7 second rudder shift. If I didn't take this, my rudder shift would be 11.2 uh, seconds. And then you combine it with the propulsion modification because this allows you to you know, go from 0 knots to, I think, 10 knots or so very, very, very quickly. And this allows, combined with the Hydro, for you to dodge most, if not all, of the torpedoes fired at your smokescreen. So, in the next slot, obviously I use aiming systems. You could use the smoke generator, but I don't like that it makes the smoke last 5% less time. And this means that there is a bigger gap between when your smokescreen ends and when you can use the next one. Right now it's 40 sec 40.4 seconds, and my smoke screen is laying down for 34.5 seconds. But if I took the smoke generator modification one instead, the gap between the two smoke screens would increase. So in the second slot, I use the hydro special hydro upgrade. If I didn't have this one, I would obviously take damage control system modification one. And in the first slot, I use the main arms modification one. So here, instead of the Hydra, you could take one of the planes. The spotting plane is a very interesting choice, but I think Hydra is better, because Hydra allows you to stay safe in your smokescreen. So, one of the uh, downsides, as I mentioned, of the Anchorage, is the fact that her anti-air is rather weak. Uh, she does have 58 kilometer range on it, but as you can see, she only has the long-range anti-air, that does 88 and DPS, and the short range anti air that does 214. The short range isn't very useful because planes very often don't get within 2.4 kilometers of your ship. Uh, you know, usually medium range is that what I think does most of the anti air damage. So let's take a quick look at the armor scheme. So, as I mentioned, the bow is 27, the side armor plate is 27, the deck is 27, uh, the citadel armor is 152, and the stern is also 27 millimeters. Here you can look at where the citadel is, below the front and rear turrets, it is below water, but in the middle it is above the waterline. So all you have to do is make sure your shells land roughly in the middle of the ship, and that the uh, ship isn't angled enough so that your shells don't ricochet. Yeah, 
I would say this is a very neat ship, and I do enjoy playing her. Definitely more than the Buffalo. So I think that if you can get her for a reasonable amount of effort, then you should try to get her. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I would like to thank the patrons on Patreon. Thank you very much for your continued support, and I hope I'll see you guys next time.